You've seen the title, and you probably felt like me years ago when I first encountered any semblance of thermodynamics and chemistry. And you're left wondering, why on earth do I have to learn all of this complicated stuff? Isn't chemistry about chemicals? Yet there's a lot of math and physics to it that seems to describe something almost completely unrelated to chemistry. Why on earth are chemists trying to make life more complicated than it already is? What I'm here to do for you today is to bring you through a tourist's perspective of thermodynamics and chemistry, and by the end of this video, convince you that thermodynamics is essential to chemistry because it tells you two main things about a chemical reaction, whether a reaction will happen and the price you pay for that chemical reaction. Well, how do we begin to grasp that? There are a lot of factors at play in chemical reactions the bonds between the chemicals, their size, their reactivities, and so on. And I think when we're faced against a hard science problem, it is a really good idea to simplify the problem so that we could build enough intuition to come back and tackle the harder version of the problem. So let's rephrase our goal slightly for now to simply whether any action would happen and the price you would pay for that action to happen. And let's forget about chemical reactions and focus on a much simpler action, dropping a ball on the floor. So in the realm of thermodynamics, we divide the universe into two parts. The system is what we're focused on, and the surroundings are everything else in the universe that is not the system. In this case, our ball is the system and the floor is our surrounding. When a ball drops, all of its molecules travel in the same direction. This type of motion is called work essentially orderly motion. And when the ball hits the ground, the work done on the surroundings is converted into heat, also known as energy in the form of random motion of its molecules. The main takeaway from this is that energy can convert between different forms and that the sum total of the energy always remains the same. This observation is so fundamental that it has a name, the first law of thermodynamics. However, after the conversion, there is still enough juice in the ball, so it keeps bouncing. And each time it bounces, it converts its energy into heat, until there's nothing left and it can't bounce anymore. Let's be a little bit clever and leverage the first law a little bit here. Since we know that the energy can be converted back and forth, is it possible to use the heat loss to push the ball back to where it came from? However, sadly, you actually can't do that. To find out why, let's take a closer look at the particles. They're moving in random motion because of the heat. However, to make use of that energy, the molecules would need to be moving in a uniform motion. The chance that those random movements coalesce into a uniform motion is highly unlikely. And because of this unlikeliness, the ball will never move back to its starting point due to heat loss. In thermodynamics lingo, we call this irreversibility. So to conclude, the ball would spontaneously convert its energy into random motion, but it would not spontaneously convert its energy into orderly motion. This is in fact only one of the faces of this trend. Chemical reactions prefer to have things take on as many forms and spread out as much as possible. And say, if you can find a gas in a small volume, there will be less possible forms that the gas could take on. But if you lift the piston up, the gas would spontaneously spread out because it wants to take on more possible forms. This trend is so prevalent that people come up with ways to describe it, namely, entropy. One thing of note is that if your action increases the entropy of the universe in any way, that action is irreversible, and that entropy change of the universe is always greater than or equal to zero. This is yet another fundamental fact that it's made another law of thermodynamics, the second law. So the laws we've just extracted from simply observing our ball and the floor setup isn't only just applicable to this setup itself, but these laws describe how chemical reactions behave as well. However, still, chemical reactions are perhaps 
a little bit too complicated to describe right now. So we would do the same thing that we did before and continue making another toy model. This time, though, we need to make it a little more complicated so that we can explore something more akin to chemicals. To make our toy simple enough, but still descriptive, let's pick which state of matter this toy should take on. Let's look at solids first. The main problem with solids are that they have tight chemical bonds between them, and that will be quite a hassle to describe mathematically. So the key here is to look for something that doesn't have that many bonds. Liquids might also be a good option, until you realize that liquids still have interactions between molecules, so that is not quite what we want. Gases, on the other hand, have almost no molecular interactions. Not only that, but we're also free to change volumes, number of particles, and temperatures quite easily, compared to liquids and solids. So we're going to use gases as a base for our toy model. And to be even simpler than that, We'll pretend our gases particles don't interact at all and just bump into each other like billiard balls. This is what we call the ideal gas model, and that this will be one of the handiest toy models that you'll ever use in your chemistry journey. Ideal gases are simple enough that the equation also reflects the simplicity. Essentially, what it's saying is that if you increase the number of particles, that or the temperature of the gas, this allows the gas to take on higher pressures and volumes. And when you add work or heat onto the gas system, that energy goes into something called the internal energy of the gas. Think of a gas as the battery. You can charge it up using heat or work. The stored energy is the internal energy. And for now, this internal energy is just a reflection of the gas's temperature. However, it can also mean a multitude of things for more complicated systems, so just keep that in mind for now. And in general for any system, we can turn this statement into a mathematical equation. The change in internal energy is equal to the sum of work and heat, or delta U is equal to Q heat plus W work. Now let's try putting the first law into action on our ideal gas a little bit. Say, we remove some energy in the form of work where the gas pushes the piston upwards, thus losing energy in that push. And let's say we try to compensate that loss by applying some heat. However, let's say the heat loses in this tug of war, and according to the first law, a price must be paid. And the price in this case is the internal energy decreasing, meaning the temperature must also decrease. Not only is it paradoxical that something can drop in temperature after heating, but also this perfectly illustrates the start of how we can calculate the price we have to pay for chemical reactants to happen. And we'll continue this trend of using ideal gases to explore and build up intuition for more complex chemical processes and reactions. So in summary, the first law gives us a way to know the price we pay for our reactions. Not only that, but in this series, we'll definitely touch on the practical ways we can measure changes in internal energy. The second law tells you whether a reaction will spontaneously happen by leveraging the fact that the entropy of the universe always increases, and we'll be modifying that vague statement into something more applicable to chemical reactions, and this is known as Gibbs free energy, and how this Gibbs free energy is related to the idea of chemical equilibrium. And I think that's a good enough picture for us to be able to complete our task, have something that can predict which chemical reactions can happen and the price you pay for that reaction. Thank you so much for watching, please like and subscribe, and I'll see you next week on the topic of ideal gases.